just as the net force on a charge, capital Q, is equal to the sum of all the forces from nearby objects around it, we can compute the net electric field from a collection of charges because these represent the potential for them to act and exert a net force if we were to place a charge capital Q over here somewhere to the right. So just because it's because of the fact that forces add as vectors, it is also the case that electric fields will add as vectors. And the net electric field from a configuration of several charges like drawn in this picture will simply be an expression E equals the sum from 1 over to the number of charges of the individual electric fields exerted by those charges at some location over here. And each of these will then equal 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the charge of that thing, divided by the distance squared to some location at which we're trying to evaluate the electric field times this unit vector. It is possible for electric fields from individual objects to add together or to work against one another depending on the signs of those ve unit vectors. So we must always be thinking about placing some new charge, capital Q, over here to the right and asking ourselves what is the net force on this charge, capital Q, from all these neighbors around it. And then once we calculate that net force, divide back by that charge, capital Q, and that gives us the net electric field at this location from this collection of charges. Let us consider a simple example of two charges, a positive and a negative, located nearby one another, and ask ourselves what is the net electric field from the superposition of these two charges. We'll imagine one positive and one negative. We can consider some point in space, for example down here and to the left. To compute the net electric field, we would compute at this location R the electric field individually from the positive charge and the negative charge. Now this location R is located a vector distance R1 from the left hand charge, positive, the positive, and it's located a, a vector distance R2 from the negative charge. And so when we compute the net electric field, E1 it is the sum, vector sum of E1 and E2, where we're not using just R in the denominator of making that calculation, but the individual vector distances R1 and R2. If we can consider the, the the little arrow coming from the positive charge, it points down and to the right. If we consider the vector arrow coming from the, the negative charge, it actually doesn't point down and to the left, it points up and to the right because the electric field in this case is trying to draw an imaginary positive charge here up toward this thing. So we have a down and to the right arrow adding to an up and to the left arrow. The up part and the down part will slightly cancel. And if we were to consider what is the net arrow at that location, it actually just points over to the right, like the small arrow that I've drawn right here. At any point around this area, I can draw an electric field vector. And the net electric field vector is always the sum of the individual arrow from the left-hand charge and the individual arrow from the right-hand charge. And you notice what happens to the electric fields at different locations. If we're over here near the positive charge, then the arrows look pretty much like you were just near a single charge, the positive. That's because the electric field from the right-hand charge is relatively weak because it's far away from the right-hand charge. On the other hand, if we're over here near the left-hand charge, the distance r to the left-hand charge is small, and the electric field contribution from this one is big, whereas the electric field contribution from the left-hand charge will be small, because the distance is big. Notice what happens to the electric field arrows. They get bent slightly off of their normal course. If I'm here near the positive charge, the electric field more or less looks like it would have looked if there was only the positive charge, but it's slightly bent over to the left because of the negative charge. If I'm slightly in the middle, or if I'm somewhat in the middle, then the field arrows point over to the left just as they would have from either the positive or the negative charge, but they're reinforced. If I'm over here near the negative charge, it is mostly a field from 
uh, negative charge and drawing in toward the negative charge, but you notice it's bent slightly off its normal course by the existence of the positive charge. And so wherever I am on this plane, I can imagine what would happen to a positive charge. It would, for example, if starting out over here, eventually drift over to the negative charge. It would follow those arrows. If it was located right here, it would drift along these arrows toward the negative charge. Or if it was located down here, it would drift down into the right, down into the right, and then eventually circle back or in toward the negative charge. So these arrows at any time, at any location, indicate for me what is the net force at that location, and we can essentially follow them to follow a trajectory of a charge if we were to place it somewhere on this map. We could do the same exercise for the superposition of two positive charges. Let us imagine a positive charge located on the left and a positive charge located on the right. At some point R, we can always draw the net electric field from these two charges. Let's consider this point right here. The electric field from the left charge is pointing down and to the right. The electric field from the right-hand charge is pointing down and to the left. The left component and the right component cancel and the and that electric field is pointing straight down. In all cases, we are going to be computing a vector sum. If we were to actually carry this exercise out, we would see an electric field map that looks like follows. Imagine at every single point, these arrows represent the sum of two electric fields, one coming from the left-hand side, one coming from the right-hand side, and this represents the direction of the net force that would be experienced by a positive charge located right at that location. And we can imagine what would happen to a positive charge if it was placed somewhere on this plane. If it was placed right here, it would be pushed away from the positive charge, but eventually be directed up. Or if it were placed down here, it would be a plate propelled away from the ne negative charge, but eventually pushed down. And that's because as it moves further away from the positive charge here and gets into a weaker field, it's also starting to pick up the field from the right-hand charge. Another way of representing this situation is to draw these arrows connected to one another and draw what are called lines of electric field. These lines now represent for us what would be the trajectory or followed by a charge if it were placed somewhere on this plane and it was a positive charge. So imagine I placed a positive charge here, it would eventually be directed away and circle back in toward the negative charge. Or if I were placed a char positive charge right there, it would be directed down, away from the, the, the left-hand charge, and then over to the negative charge. Likewise, if I were to place a positive charge somewhere in this direction, in this picture, it would be directed away from the positive charge, but then be it pushed down. Again, as before, the lines of electric field represent the direction of force and the trajectory that would be followed if we placed a positive charge somewhere in the picture. The density of the field lines indicate the, the magnitude of the force, or the electric field. Notice on the right-hand picture, there is actually a region where there are no electric field lines, and that's located right at the center of the picture. That's because if I were to place a positive charge or a negative charge, directly in the center of these two positive charges, they would feel, that new charge would feel an equal and opposite force from each of the two, the left-hand and the right-hand charges, and the net force would be zero. Once again, the density of electric field lines matches our intuition about the magnitude of the force or the magnitude of the electric field in those regions. It is possible using the principle of superposition to derive the electric field for a variety of configurations of electric charge. I will not ask you to derive these things, but I will ask you to remember. The electric field from a, po a point charge is simply K times the magnitude of that charge, capital Q, divided by the distance squared that you are away from that charge, times this unit vector R. So if you're out near point charge, this is the expression for electric field. You can also have a line of charge. Imagine a, a long wire that has a built-up charge all along its length. If we define lambda as the density of charge delta Q divided by length along the wire delta X, so it's how many coulombs per meter are stored along this wire, then the electric field around this wire is 2 times the constant K times this lambda 
divided by r, not r squared, but just r, times r hat. So in other words, the electric field lines point out away directly from the wire. If we have a sheet of charge, again we can compute the net electric field from chunks of little charge somewhere in the sheet. And if we define the quantity Greek letter sigma as the amount of charge per unit area, so delta Q divided by delta A, the electric field points away from the sheet or toward the sheet, depending on whether sigma is positive or negative. In other words, the charge of the sheet is positive or negative. And the magnitude of the electric field is sigma divided by 2 times epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is that constant in the MKS unit system we mentioned before. So again, it is not important to derive these kinds of expressions, but it is important to remember to be able to use them.